Hi everyone, I'm Victor Gitchan. Thank you for watching the Contributors Podcast. My today's guest is a serial entrepreneur and investor who ran several startups from concept to capital raising to IPO. If you want to learn top secrets on how to make calls to C-level executives successfully, watch this interview until the end because my today's guest has extensive experience helping international companies enter the US market by developing business plans, sales strategies, and assisting with very serious level sales call. During his 28 year plus career, he has held executive positions with Hewlett Packard, Mirantis, Siemens and Planalytics, attaining numerous sales and marketing awards and specializing in global strategic innovation leadership, sales, marketing, operational and investment management. Currently, Gary is co-chair of the American of Commerce Technology Committee and recently he has been named one of the top 30 most influential executives to watch. Please welcome a CEO and co-founder of GSD Venture Studios, Gary Fowler. Gary, to start off our conversation, I would like to ask what inspired you to become an entrepreneur? What happened so you decided to quit your job and start your own business? So what is your life story? How did all this start? Well, you know, I went to graduate school, undergraduate in psychology and business, and then graduate school in clinical psychology. And I got out of school and I thought, well, geez, what am I going to do? So I could either go back, I wanted, thought about being a doctor, or, you know, I always liked uh, business and I always liked sales and marketing. So I just by chance happened to get involved with construction. What happened is I had a martial arts instructor and I would go into my classes at six o'clock in the morning privately. And I said to him, what do you do for a living? He said, I am a contractor. And I said, how do you have so much time? I thought contractors get up early. He said, well, business is slow because interest rates are high. And, you know, being the uh, dumb kid that I was, I thought, oh, this is great. Why don't I build some houses? So I went down. I was down at this bookstore and I was looking up the designs just by chance and I thought wonder if he can build this house so I bought the magazine I took it down to him and I said hey Dale I said can you build this house and I drew the inside of the house myself and what I wanted it to look like he said sure I can do that I said okay so by chance I went to the bank and uh, got a loan built a house and I sold it in four months 40% margin four months from the picture I didn't even have the house built Right. So I did it. And then I thought, well, this is easy. Why don't I just build two? Well, you know, I'm a country boy from Pennsylvania. I'll build two of these houses the same. So what happened is I built the houses, both of them sold. Then I said, well, geez, this is pretty easy. So I bought the part of the top of a mountain. People said there wouldn't be water and sewer for some time. I put first rate refusal. Lo and behold, all of a sudden water and sewer. So these lots in front of the hospital went up in value. And I thought, well, geez, doctors are going to want to come there. So I built another house. And that one I probably we made 65% a lot of money and because the land went up and the rest is history but the key is you got to believe in your dreams Victor you got to believe that you can do it passion optimism visualization I did a TED talk about that you got to <laughs> like visualize where you want to be and manifest just like my friend and partner David Yang you got to manifest where you want to be and then take those actions because you know Victor a lot of people talk but they don't get shit done and how old were you when you sold your first house uh, I was about 22 23 Ooh. Wow. Something like that. I was right out of graduate school and you know I had taken a job with a company sales so it was selling Apple computers at the time so I was doing this you know part-time but I thought this is unbelievable this is what entrepreneurship but you know it was not because I'm smart it was because the market was really really good and luck is the most important thing I understand but you were not afraid of people talking oh this land is useless you just follow your dream or the universe help you to achieve your dreams this is amazing first like chimed in like crazy I never forget it's like and the, that same bookstore I'll tell you a little story so I got a car magazine down there and I was looking through this car magazine and on the cover was this Lamborghini inside the back of the magazine there was a Lamborghini for sale and I looked at it and it had Ferrari wheels so it was like odd looking and I thought how can this be the same color car they don't make that many of those by chance I called the guy up and he said yeah I'm a doctor and I said you know what's going on your cars for sale and I said I can't afford 
it was like a hundred thousand dollars, right? And he said, "Well, I'm getting divorced, and I really need the money." I said, "Well, how much would you take?" I said, uh, thirty thousand dollars. And he said, um, "That's all I can do." And he said, "I'll take it." On Sunday, I talked to him. On Monday, he drove the car to me, and here I am. All of a sudden, it's manifested, right? Now I got these houses, and now I've got this Lamborghini. It was unbelievable. I bought it. Kept it, drove it around, but it was so unique. There weren't many around, like being Tom Cruise in a car, because people were like, as soon as you got in that car, you had a different personality. Thank you, thank you for sharing. So, according to Entrepreneur Magazine, the five core responsibilities of a CEO are following. Own the vision, provide the proper resources, build the culture, make good decisions, oversee and deliver the company's performance. Gary, what critical component of your position makes your job as a CEO challenging? You know, you always got to keep the creativity of a child, Victor. It's very important to always question things and be curious because curiosity is where there's opportunity. Most people, as they get older, they start to be afraid of doing things. But as you get older and you want to really flourish and flower in your life, you got to like not give up that curiosity of a child. And if you do that, it'll help you throughout your entrepreneurial endeavor. The other thing that they didn't talk about is trust. You got to trust your employees. Employees. You got to, from my perspective, be on an equal playing field so they understand that you're willing to step in and do the grunt work and work side by side with them to get the job done. You're not better than them. You're one of them. And right. you're all out there to make the company better. It's not about you. It's about the company moving forward. That's really powerful. Yeah, you're right. Gary, since you have uh, become a serial AI entrepreneur with 17 startups and IPO, where were you most like satisfied in your job and why? I'm satisfied every day. Day. To be honest with you, Victor, I like I look at a new day as a new opportunity, and so I try to do something differently. You know, a few years ago, I had um, dinner with a guy by the name, or actually lunch, with Scott McNeely. He was a founder of Sun Microsystems, and uh, which was sold to Oracle. And I met him out in California, and we were talking. And I remember he told me many years ago, always go to the area that you fear the most because you're going to learn the most. Every time I've done that, I have had incredible rewards because people just, you know, they're afraid to. Go in some area and if you go down there first or early the chances are you're going to reap the benefits it's just incredible and so from my standpoint is don't be afraid i see so for you the most impressive and satisfactory kind of challenge and thing it's a, do something new you never done before challenge yourself i get on my bike and i ride my you know i have uh, 14 bikes i got six electric bikes and i'll get on my bike and i said to myself here i am can i ride 65 miles in one day and that's a lot of riding i didn't want to do it all at one time i wanted to do it you know three times and try it so 20 some miles every time set goals for yourself and achieve those goals because when you achieve then the manifestation is you can do it again and again it's like keeping a knife sharp the other thing it's really important victor it's mm -hmm. like when you wake up in the morning and you stub your toe on your bed and it hurts and then the rest of the day it sucks because you lose your keys you back into somebody with your car you know you don't take your dog out to right time all kinds of things you'll lose your wallet get yourself in a positive environment if that happens step back and breathe think about the positive things the things you're grateful for in your life and that's what a startup's about because you have ups and downs and ins and outs as you know don't look for the bottom think about the glasses being half full and not being half empty wow that's impressive as steve jobs once said find your passion otherwise you are gonna quit when it gets hard this is like exactly what you just said yeah you need to be passionate and positive thank you there are seven biggest mistakes a ceo can make taking shortcuts to growth never stepping away from the business relying solely on their own perspective having an ego making erratic decisions not finding a good guide focusing entirely on their own growth gary what are the top three mistakes a CEO should avoid based on your experience? Yeah, so you always want to hire people that, that are smarter than you. Don't try to get into a situation where you're controlling people. Look for people that are smarter than you because that's mm -hmm. how you make a rich team. Look at intergenerational teams. You know, today we focus, especially in the startup community that I'm in, people want to be young, under 30 years old. But to be honest with you today, it's really about intergenerational teams. Why? Mm -hmm. Because that gray hair means they have experience in the context to help get the job done. Mm -hmm. We need to build teams. We need cultural diversity and we also need decentralized teams. Why? Because if we're doing R&D work, we want to go with the best cost 
and the best quality is done. So hire smart people, hire diverse people and different generation like millennials and not only your age. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I would rather have 50 year olds in a company in combined with young because they have different ideas and different contacts. You can tell you I've been in tech for 37 years plus. Imagine who I know. You know, it's not it's I've been around a long time. So Bob Dorf and Steve Blank and many, many, many people without dropping names around the world. We're mm -hmm. in 38 countries today. I do a lot of work in Africa, a lot of work in Asia, a lot of work in Latin America, a lot of work all over the U.S. So anybody can do it. You know, Victor, listen, I'm a country boy from Pennsylvania. My father was a teacher. My mother was a housewife. If it was black and white in the field, it was a cow, you know, if it was big. If it was a little smaller, maybe it's a goat. But the situation, <laughs> you know, I went down through and I learned some basic lessons. Get up early, you know, get your work done, work hard. And another lesson I learned, we had a couple lakes near my house. I'll never forget this, Victor. My friend said to me, let's go fishing. And I knew that the fish truck that drops the fish off had dropped them in one of the lakes. And I said to my friend, let's go to this lake. He said, no, no, I'm going to the other lake. I went over to my lake and I caught six fish. I caught my limit. All the fish you could get for the day with a license. My friend, he didn't catch any. Go where the fish are. Fish in the right lake. Go out where those customers are located. Put yourself in that environment and become part of it. I see what you mean. Yeah, this is, makes sense. Don't try to create the traffic. Be there where the traffic is, right? Yeah, and just make sure you don't get in an accident. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Awesome. Thank you. So, Gary, you sound like a superman, like 36 countries, 17 or more startups, so many businesses. You deliver speeches at TED. You deliver other speeches. You just spoke with uh, Steve Wozniak at the same stage. It's uh, going to IPO with the companies. One of the toughest decisions for executives to make is uh, which project to prioritize. So what is your typical way of dealing with difficult situation? Give us an example. I'll give you a direct example because I spoke at the United Nations a week ago Ooh. at the 76th Assembly. And one of the things we went through, all these people, and they were talking about AR and VR as a tool to combat violent extremism and terrorism. Why, Victor, they wanted me on a panel, I have no idea. But they asked me to be there and I was there. I listened to all of them and I was going to talk about an AR and VR. And one of the things that happened to me, I had a revelation and they came to me and I said, I think the United Nations has this all wrong. I think it's technology is a tool for peace. Let's create jobs in places like Africa, places like Syria, places all over the world. Let's give jobs where people can work together. They can take care of their families. Mother Teresa said it's not about stopping war. It's about pro-peace. Let's create a very positive environment. And I said it at the UN to the Under Secretary General of the UN. A day later, I got a call. They said, we want to let you know that you shook up the United Nations. I didn't intend to do that. I got a call and they said it was amazing and we want to figure out how we can work with you because what you said is right. And I believe it's true because look at the challenges, Victor, in front of us. The average temperatures around the world could go up nine degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century. By 2050, we're going to have to double the amount of food to feed everybody. And we can't increase the number of livestock because 26% of the pollution today is caused by them. At the same time, the population as it's, it's going up from 8.1 billion to 13 billion is going to be a lot of challenges. As I said, global warming. As I said, the population increase. And global warming, think about this, the Gulf Stream could stop. The food supply will dramatically go down because we're not going to have that cycle anymore. And it can happen overnight. I work a startup. Data in front of us, Victor, think about this. Each one of your audience today has about 300,000 items in their personal cloud. The entire mm. web in 1996 was 257,000 websites. You, Victor, have no information in your personal cloud, the entire web. The challenge is, Victor, that number doubles every year. In five years, Victor, you're going to have 10 million items with the Internet of Things. Oh, Think right. about this. How many times in the last three weeks has somebody said, Victor, I sent you a message. Where did you send it? I sent it to your Google account. Right. Uh, I sent it to Yandex. I sent it to account. When did you send it? I sent it a week and a half ago. Will you send it again? I can't find it. We are all in a state of infobesity. We need to have tools out there to help us make decisions. CEOs need tools that are unsupervised and semi-supervised AI to help us. Kind of like your grandmother, right? So right. your Baba will go down through and help you understand in a kind way 
way, in an empathetic and compassion way to make decisions. So with that being said, we need to have emotion AI, which I've written about extensively. We need compassion and empathy built in. That's, yeah, I like this infobicity term. Did you make this term? Is it yours? I read a book in the uh, 70s by Alvin Toffler, and I never forgot the term. I knew there would be a point at some point in my life that I would use it. And that point came recently where I understood wow. that infobesity is around all of us and we got to do something about it. Yeah, that's true. As Jack Welch, former chairman and CEO of General Electric once said, I've learned that mistakes can often be as good as a teacher as success. Under Welch, leadership GE was hugely successful. It's, it's market value growing by a stunning $398 billion. But when mistakes are repeated, they become destructive. So Gary, uh, what is your greatest failure story? What did you learn and how did you recover from it? My greatest failure story is I like peanut butter puster parfaits. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I love those from Dairy Queen. And that was my greatest thing because I love I gained probably twelve pounds because he oh, Buster Parfait. You know, all kidding aside, it's like I've learned that, you know, I have to continually question myself in terms of moving forward. You know, a few years ago I got divorced and at forty eight years old I went back to school in Russia. I went to Moscow State University for five years. Oh, I great. lived in a student dorm. I learned again and I ended up having the vision of a child, right? Because I looked at the world as an 18 or 19 year old would look at it. I looked at it totally differently. And one of the things we have to do, and again, that's encountering the fear, do something differently. Treat yourself. Try it because it will make you better. Always, right. always learn. Don't be afraid. Wow. What a great story. 48 okay. years old, you become a student and then your life changed after that because you learn new things, right? My life changed. I ended up going to Skolkova and becoming a professor. <laughs> we started Startup Academy, Lawrence Wright and myself at Skolkova, then GVA. So we did GVA launch gurus. So it, it things move forward in your life. But again, you can't be afraid. If my friend said, what's wrong with you? I can't, they would laugh at me. You're going back to university? What's wrong? But then once I went back, they all, they said, this is unbelievable. Because what I did is I started to learn. Then I started to think of things differently. Then I right. understood. I started doing speaking engagements. I started to do music. I started to do things that I wanted. And all of a sudden, the world started to revolve you know and visualize and manifest and it became true right this is amazing thank you dear viewers if you like this interview and find it helpful please like and share this video to spread the wisdom if you want to be notified about my upcoming guests subscribe below if you want to learn top secrets on what to do to make your calls to see level successful watch this interview until the end gary could you tell your viewers as a CEO and co-founder of GSD Venture Studios, what makes GSD Venture Studios special? Why organizations should use GSD? One of the things that we do is we travel the world looking for those resilient teams. As I said, intellectual capacity, Victor, is evenly spread, but opportunities aren't. So we go to places like Nigeria, Zambia, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, all over, all over India. We look for those opportunities where there's incredibly bright folks that have come up with ideas. We get them before the venture capitalists see them. And what we do is we help them go global using Silicon Valley as a port. You know, and, and as you said about you know, one of the, the points is getting to those C-level executives, believe that you can do it, be smart, use LinkedIn, use all your contact network to figure out how to get to them, but come back to them with a value proposition. Come back with a, something that will impact their business because that's critically important. Whether it start out with, you know, one of the things I did with one of my companies, I said, you can't control the weather, but you can control control the impact on your business. And I showed the executive at one of the top retailers, the CEO of that company, how we could impact his business. I gave him a little tiny sound bite. He invited me into his office and I sold him a deal for a quarter of a million dollars, which was a big deal for that little company. Again, encounter your fear, but don't be stupid. Go out and do your research and figure out how to use a map, a relationship map to get to that person. We all have an opportunity to change our lives. We all have an opportunity to, as Steve Jobs said, make the dent in the universe. This is a time that we we need to go out and use technology as a tool for peace, technology to help us live longer, technology to help us live better lives. All of us have an opportunity to do it. Let's not think about the negatives about people. Let's think about how we can work together, make this planet better. Wow. Yeah, this is the message. Thank you, Gary. Mark Zuckerberg once said, if I try to build a business that connects people around the world, I would never start Facebook. What is GSD's mission? Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, because there's opportunities all over there. I mean, we're in Palo Alto 
though. Think about it. This is, again, this is like, keep it simple, stupid. Silicon Valley, Victor, is a port to the rest of the world. Good on bad or indifferent. Stanford University is there. And some of the most incredible minds from around the wor world happen to be located there. So if I need the networking connections, I'm in Palo Alto, five minutes from my office, I can go to Sand Hill Road and I can talk to folks. If I go to Starbucks, many times on a Saturday morning, I see Tim Cook in there. Now, I'm not Tim Cook's friend by any means, but I talk to him. Hello, how are you? You know, that kind of thing. Use the network. You're now, you're in that lake with the fish. So go out there and use it properly. We at GSD, what we're doing is we're looking for those resilient teams. We're given an operational expertise and knowledge. It's not like a typical accelerator. So we have two pieces to GSD. It's about getting in there and getting your hands dirty with them. Who do you need to talk to? What partners? Let's figure out how we can get to them. Let's come up with a strategy. Let's talk about how to get visibility. Because as you know, Victor, today with the digital transformation upon us, we need to have credibility. Because as soon as somebody gets you on Zoom, what do they do? They look up who you are. Right. Who are you? Are right. you an industry expert or not? It happens all the time. Make sure you got some things out there. At the same time, make sure your deck makes sense. Use Guy Kawasaki's principles. But keep it simple. Go down mm -hmm. through. Look at your traction. Look at what you're trying to accomplish. Let's come out with a model to be able to be successful. And it works. One of my companies last week got a $38 million contract coming through my accelerator. $38 oh. Eight million. Another one's closing a $1.3 million round. And this is not tough. It's just being smart and finding those companies that are out there that have incredible potential, bringing them together and take using Silicon Valley as a port. On the other side, we have a venture studio. There we take operational roles in the company, much like I did with my friend David Jang. So I became the CEO and president of Viva. The idea is put yourself in. We have a lot of visibility and contacts. We can help that company grow. We take a 360 degree view we look at where the weaknesses are in the company. We plug those weaknesses up. We do equity based on KPIs and we help that company grow and it works. It is the model that's going through COVID and we tested it, we worked it, and it's we're growing like crazy because of that. And each company should have an equal opportunity. It doesn't matter where they're from, from Lagos, Nigeria, from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, from Moscow, Novosibirsk, Kaliningrad, doesn't matter where you're from, Kiev. The idea is get out there, get the visibility because you know, Victor, it's like having a Ferrari. If it's in your garage and nobody ever sees it, it's your Ferrari. But right. once you take it on the road, and more importantly, you put it on the track and you have the right drivers there, you can win the Formula One. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And you have helped a lot of international companies, as you just mentioned, enter the U.S. market. So how do you evaluate success? Like, for example, you could help a company and then at what point do you say, OK, this is success. This is good. How do you evaluate? Are they getting sales? Do they have the right kind of advisors on their board? We the KPIs that we agreed to, are we accomplishing those KPIs? Are they having companies coming up and looking at potentially acquiring them? Uh, have they raised the kind of money that they need? Many times foreign companies underestimate how much they should raise because mm. they just don't look at the model properly. They don't understand what it means to go global and more importantly, how much it's going to cost. So what we do is we inject some realism there. We're looking for passionate CEOs and teams, people that are very positive, people that want to do it, you know, not negative. They're really positive. And what we want to do is work with those companies and flexible, resilient companies that can pivot. I see. So you put KPIs and when the KPIs achieved, then you can say this is success. The idea is we set realistic KPIs mm. for them. Mm realistic KPIs for ourselves. We're mm -hmm. in it together. We're in it to win it. It's like a marriage. We want it to work. We want to win. We put our credibility on the line. We're putting their company on the line. And the idea is to be an incredible success. So Gary, you are a recognized expert in entrepreneurship and consultant to numerous international companies and startups. What is your most memorable mentorship experience? Can you share with us? You know, you know a lot of the people that I know, so I got to, <laughs> but I've had companies, the AI companies where we've had extremely successful serial entrepreneurs and we got started with a dream and now it's one of the top 10 AI HR tech companies in the world. Mm -hmm. That really was outstanding for me because it was, we had to pivot. And when you have somebody that's worth upwards of a billion dollars as your partner, you know, it's very interesting. And at the same time, if you come from another country to the US, and you try to raise money and funds, people don't know who you are, right? You're just a, you're just somebody. Making it become real, making it manifest itself. So I would say that's one of them, but I've had a lot. Skolkova Startup Academy, when I co-founded that, and it was nothing, just an idea. We had three people in the Entrepreneurs Club, you know, so Lawrence Wright had brought me in to basically advise and mentor. Then I became part of it with them. And it was beautiful to see people smiling faces. I had almost 2,400 people in the auditorium when we had Guy Kawasaki come over. 
over. And I knew that day, Victor, when I looked out in the center of the crowd. In fact, David Jang was right in the middle. And uh, I remember looking right at David's face. Before we were partners, I just saw him. I knew him there. And I uh-huh. said, this is incredible because he. I saw him smiling from ear to ear. And I saw Guy Kawasaki, as he says, enchant the audience. And for me, that was an incredible experience. When people have hope, people believe in their dreams. That really makes me feel good. So And, and when they have success. So what it does is it really curates success. Right. Dear viewers, if you want to learn top secrets of what to do to make your calls to C-level successful, stay tuned, stay with us until the end because my guest, Gary, he has experience and he will share with us those secrets. Gary, in my experience, the most challenging part of being a leader is applying the right amount of leadership. What aspect of leadership do you find the most difficult? Well, I mean, the thing is, I'm a psychologist. I've studied human behavior for many years, right? So I had a four-star admiral on my show, the former number two guy in the U.S. military. And I asked him a very pointed question. I said, what was the most difficult moment that you had as a four-star admiral? And he was in the White House working for the president. And he said, when I had to go on a ship during Desert Storm, and I knew that 10% of my planes probably weren't going to come back, and I was going to have to write their mothers and fathers and wives and their kids and tell them what happened. I said, what's the most important uh, quality for a successful leader? And I believe this too is compassion. Like caring about the people more than you do yourselves. To show them that you care about them and you want to make sure that they're successful. And from my standpoint, you know, it's not hard, but it's one of the things that I always work on is you need to show compassion and caring. Very important to be compassionate, to understand the situation and it helps to solve problems better because you show to the person that you are on his page or her page. And you know Mm -hmm. what happens, Victor, and I've learned this too, is if you do that and if you stumble, you're a CEO of a company and something happens, not because of your fault, people are willing to stand with you. They're going to stand with you through the dark times because they know that you care. Yeah, that's true. Awesome. I haven't met even one successful person who didn't face serious challenges. Believe the bigger challenges. uh, I believe that the bigger challenges we can overcome, the more successful we become. Uh, What was the biggest challenge in your life and how did you overcome it? And uh, what is your success story? When I got divorced, it was a big challenge. Let me tell (laughs) you. That sucked. What did you learn? (laughs) I learned that uh, you need a prenuptial agreement. (laughs) Oh, I see. This is a good thing. No, I learned that, you know, that sometimes in life you have differences and you can't resolve those. But at the same time, you got to care and, again, keep a positive attitude. Because if you go down, it's kind of like when water goes down a drain. If you start to think negative, the water goes down the drain, your emotions go down. What I did for myself during those uh, times is I would do positive things for myself. Take Uh a walk for five miles. What Uh different Uh things. And what I did is I kept that going up and I rebuild it up and help other people. One of the things I found that was incredibly rewarding is to go out and if you can help other people, you're essentially helping yourself mentally because all those endorphins and encephalons kick in and it makes you feel good. And you do it enough times and all of a sudden you start, your mind starts to turn around and look in a positive direction. So it's really important to do that. And so my thing is, you know, my wife now tells me, she said, you're always positive. And I said, and what? <laughs> That's not a bad thing, right? Look right, at the light right. because the boost, you know, we're here for a short period of time on this planet. We need to reduce rejoice in what we have. Relish, believe in, you know, embrace what we have. It's not about all the things that are out there that we could have. It's about what we have today. Yes, those things come. If you have this kind of an attitude, those things will come in abundance for you. But, you know, appreciate the things around. The simple things in life. Sometimes, Victor, people walk down the street, never look up to look at a bird. All they're doing is looking down the street, looking at their phone. Look up. Take a second. Look up. Relish what's out there. Give your son yourself a chance to really rejoice yeah i let you know uh, you mentioned that yes, sometimes helping other people give you more comfort that you feel even better than doing something for yourself i really feel the same way so sometimes when i help somebody and this i see the reaction how a person happy about that it makes you more energy than you just do something for yourself this is a hundred percent a hundred victor when i went through my divorce one of the things a miracle happened to me i was down in uh Boca Raton, Florida. I got a call from a friend of mine. I was going back over to Russia and he said, uh, hey Gary, uh, one of my friends is going to Russia and I said, well, who's he going with? And he said, Patch Adams. Patch Adams is the guy that was portrayed by Robin Williams in the movie Patch. Mm -hmm. And it's about a doctor that has compassion for people. And I mean, it's like literally the day before I was ready to go out, he said, you should give Patch a call. I called him up. Patch Adams would get on the phone with me on the Skype and he actually recited 
Pablo Nuerta's poem from the movie. He knows 600, almost 600 poems off the top of his head. He's got... Oh, my gosh. And he would do that just to be kind to me because he knew I was... I was down, but every time he did that, it gave me energy and the spirit, and I started to give and help, and all of a sudden, things turned around. So, you know, serendipity, your life changes. If you create positive things around you, positive things will happen. Yep, people who think positive will live positive life. People who think negatively will live negative life. And this is all about thinking. So here's the 10 most common hobbies of the richest people in the world. Skiing, flying, car racing, polo, owning a wine yard, sailing, owning exotic pets, golf, art collecting, owning horses. Gary, what do you like to do outside of work? What are your hobbies? I live at the polo club in Palm Beach right now. <laughs> So I'm in California, but I live in the polo club. So I don't have polo horses, but I'm in the club here with people that do like polo. So what do I like to do? I like to ride bikes. I like to travel. I like to see things. It's not about the things that you have on the outside. It's about the things you have inside from my standpoint, because you make yourself happy. You got to look yourself in the mirror. What's going to really make you happy? Sure, skiing's fun. I love skiing. Sure, I've had a lot of houses. I probably had 50 houses. I don't know, something a lot because I built them. But uh -huh. the situation is what I like. So I like watching polo. I don't like participating. I like riding bikes. I like, uh, love bikes, love sports cars. So I've had quite a few of those. You know, the simple pleasures, the air and simple pleasures are what are most important. You go to self-actualization, Victor. It's not about the things you have. It's about the things you appreciate. Right, and experience. And right. experience, of course. So experience makes a big difference. It's like a fine bottle of wine. The more it ages, the better it gets. Yep. For the most yes. part. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Unless it doesn't get the vinegar. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. So, Gary, we all have a bunch of tasks on our to-do lists, but one of the reasons why I'm not always able to complete all my tasks is a lack of energy sometimes, you know, and uh, sometimes I just can't do anything and want to take a nap. How do you keep energy high and what is your morning routine? I mean, I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Thank so, you. I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I ride my bike for 45 minutes or an hour. Then I have breakfast. I have egg whites in the morning. I go to a little shop that's not too far from where we are. I have just egg whites and a glass of water, relax a little bit and kind of rejoice and, you know, and bring the day on. So that's how I get started with my, um, and I ride my bike at nighttime. I like to ride at night for an hour, an hour and a half mm -hmm. in the dark and just look at the stars and the moon and, and those kind of things. It's fun. Or take my sports car. Once in a while, I'll take my sports car, I'll put the top down and, and enjoy it. But it's just getting close and, you know, listen to the insects, the crickets and the and the insects. It's amazing, actually. It's so you different. ride a bike in the morning. I see. Yeah, ride a bike. I like riding bikes. That's great. Yeah, so all you buy. I feel like a kid bike. again, Victor. I get on my bikes it's like feeling a kid i'm doing the same stuff i did when i was a uh, 10 years old i get out i'm pumping my tires up riding the bikes and and uh, having fun no that's amazing feeling i've been a couple months ago in napa valley and i rented an uh, electric bike and i took a ride through the vine yards oh man this is the feeling like you just described you feel like you you alive you live life you're like a kid again you're out there right I'm, my, i have to pedal my bike so it's not like you're doing a throttle i'm pedaling mm -hmm. and so I, as i'm pedaling the bike it's just like wow this is really fun cool so now we're finally at the point of what all our viewers were waiting for so gary you assisted business uh, a lot of businesses with very c-level sales calls uh, i've been in sales for myself for almost 20 years and still learning every day. I would like to use this interview as a chance to learn from a sales and marketing guru like you some tips on sales calls to C-level executives. So could you share with uh, our audience what are three or maybe more most important things to do to make a call to C-level executive successful? Well, first of all, you got to have something that you're going to be able to give them that's very powerful and to the point. So you can't be BSing around about it, whatever it is. And mostly it's financial. So I always come back with some type of model some type of an ROI model on my product or service that'll show them how powerful we can be for the organization. That's door number one. Door number two is you got to figure out how to develop a relationship with that C-level executive. Who do you know that knows him or her? How do you get into that person? Show them. Mm -hmm. And when you 
in another meeting, if you're you're in front of them, you got to make sure you have something that shows that you've really done a lot of research. What I do, and I know this is a little old fashioned today, but what I'll do is I'll print out copies of something that I pull off the internet and I'll put it on a clipboard and I'll highlight and I'll say, and I'll actually, when I talk to them about exactly what I read in an article, sometimes it's simple things, Victor. One person, one C-level executive happened to like sailing a lot, a whole lot. And mm -hmm. I know a little bit about it. So I did a lot of research on his background and we talked about sailing for the three quarters of the meeting. He gave me the deal at the very end and I didn't even talk much about our product. Wow. So it's like a deal. It's a secret like from Dale Carnegie, right? How to make friends. You I talk mean, about I mean, what he likes. Well, because it's interesting, right? Right. You talk about the kind of things he liked sailing. He's won competitions in sailing. So I, re I did research on the boats and I did sail. So I know a little bit about it. So we started to talk about that and we developed the, that compassion. We developed that relationship, that connection. And people care about you. The more you can find places where you have similarities, the more they care about you and they want to work with you. Right, right. Because yeah, people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. This is how you get it. Exactly. Know, like, and trust. That's exactly right. People that they know are going to care about them. So one of the things I do is if you make a mistake, you got to be open and honest. Say, listen, I screwed up. Right. I didn't do this right. And I want to let you know before anybody says anything, I screwed up. It wasn't intentional. I'd do the right thing, but I'll make it right. And what you try to do is they know that you care about them and try to make things right the more apt to work with you. Wow, so cool. So first, try to give the value, like ROI or some numbers, which makes sense to even start off the conversation. Second, find who can introduce or find some piece of information to show C-level executive that you did some homework, you really know who is this person and find some background, some topic which interesting for this person so you can build relationship fast and that person would like you and would like to consider to do business with you, right? So this is- Absolutely, I'll give you a direct example I'll tell you a real story so I was in New York at the Jacob Javits Center the CEO of one of the largest retailers in the world at the time it was Sears right and uh, they merged with Cambridge it's funny how he was on stage very famous at the very very famous at the time so I saw him on stage and I memorized what he looked like so I had looked at I had done my research knew who he was and I had this whole thing prepared so I knew it came off the stage that he was going to be probably going to this one exit and I would have about two minutes for an elevator pitch mm -hmm. so and I went up to him and I said Victor and I did just like this. I said, Paul? Paul Baffico? Gary. Gary Fowler. So he's thinking he knows me. He never met me in his entire life, right? Okay. Paul? Paul Baffico? Gary. Gary Fowler. Good to see you again. And he's like, oh, wow. What are you doing? He started talking to me. He said, ah, I got this incredible company I want to talk to you about. So I had two minutes to do my elevator pitch. And I said, Paul, I want to tell you, there's going to be a storm of the century that's going to hit Hoffman States, Illinois. It's going to happen in April. And this was in January, right? It's going to dump upwards of six feet of snow. And I said, we have a non-linear weather forecasting month. And I said, we can talk about the impact it's going to have on your business. I said, I'd like to come out in April and I'd like to show you exactly what I'm talking about. And I'd like to come right after the snowstorm, right after or before the snowstorm. You mind? I can save you a lot of money. And I, I did it was millions of dollars that we could actually have helped not only save, but help them make because snow tires and all that. And he said, you know something? I think you're crazy, but I'm going to, if you can prove what you're doing, I'll set up the meeting with you. So what I did is I flew out, Victor, two days ahead of time because I had this and I went to my meteorologist I said is this I mean most people don't get a five days out now we're talking about several months out almost four months right and they said no this is going to happen to Gary during this time frame so I flew out to Illinois no snow Victor I hit the ground no snow but I rented a four-wheel dive truck and I rented the truck and I went to the hotel very close to Sears uh, location it started snowing the next day Victor it had six feet of snow right exactly yeah. how you predicted right exactly and I called Paul up and um, he gave me his phone phone number. I said, Paul, it's going to snow. He gave me his phone phone number. I called him up and I, and, and I called his office. And I said, Paul, I said, I'm here. And he said, you know, I don't want to, <laughs> I won't tell you exactly, he swore a little bit in a good way. But he said, I don't know what it is, but he said, come into my office. And so I go into his office and he said, now I don't know what kind of voodoo shit you got here. I don't know what it is. And he sat down and we had um, some alcohol, right? There's nobody there because it was right. no shot. Right. So we sat down there and we had a drink and he talked and we signed a deal. You know, he said, I've never seen anybody as bold as you. And I said, but this is what I, I ran the analysis on is each one of his categories, right? So categories down to the skew level of what was going to sell and where he could have made more money and what kind of money he could have increased and where he, he would uh, stop the loss, right? Because things wouldn't sell during that time. 
and take you up inventory space. And it was mm. unbelievable. But that's what it is. You got to be prepared to go out and show your value proposition to them and be unwavering in your belief. If you believe it, go to them. People want to talk. They're just like you and me. It's a matter of how do you get to them and get that time. And if you show value, he did it because I could show value, financial value for his company. And then we started talking on a regular basis. I see. Wow. It means what anybody can do it. Yeah, it just, it, yeah, it's a proof that it's working. This is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, no problem. So much value. Right. Thank you. In one of the latest interview, the world richest man, Elon Musk, said that he actually doesn't need money. In my opinion, it's easy to say when you are the richest man on earth, right? Gary, if money was not an issue, what would you be doing? I mean, I would be doing it exactly what I'm doing now, to be honest with you. I mean, I enjoy my life. I mean, I'm really happy, right? So, I mean, it's I like it. So, it's not about not having money. You know, I've, I've been blessed to be able to have money, but uh, it's about living the kind of life that you want to live. Who are the kind of people you want to hang around with? Where you want to go? Tomorrow I go back out to California. I'm back out in Palo Alto, meeting with my friends, driving my sports car, you know, talking to them, going to Santa Cruz. But it's about the simple pleasures in life. Sometimes, Victor, the simple pleasures are the most important one. It's not about that uh, Lamborghini Huracan. It's not about, you know, having the fastest car in the world. It's about what do you think of yourself? Can you look yourself in the mirror? Are you going out there and showing some kindness and compassion to help people? Yep, this is the best answer. So you right. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You need to do something that makes you feel good and make you feel achieving your goals. Right. I absolutely. And I know some of the richest people on the planet. In fact, some of them four blocks from me is Bill Gates and Steve Jobs' wife and Carlos Slim is not too far. Springsteen and I have the smallest house, by the way. Just so you know, the smallest place. I could be a room in some of these houses. My house is so small, but I'm still in the same neighborhood. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. For me, being an executive means being a leader. And being a leader means being a contributor because the true leaders contribute their experience, time and energy to the success of their teammates and the co-workers. Why is it being a contributor important to you? Because it shows that you're in there, you know, you're willing to roll up your sleeve and to be part of the team and get the job done. You're not above everybody. You're there as one of the contributors or one of the team members to get stuff done. I mean, that's what people want to say. If you're going out and you're doing something, you're in it doing it. I get up at five o'clock in the morning. As I'm, you go over for my breakfast, I'm on calls. Last night I was doing interviews at 10 o'clock at night. I mean, it's, you know, you have the same, that it's not like you're special and you're going to have limited hours and you're going to be gallivanting around. You're out there working. You're out there getting the job done and you care about the company. People want to know that you care about them more than you do yourself. And by showing that you're willing to get in there and roll up your sleeve and get the job done, we're all equal. Well, I truly believe what you just said, that yeah, you need to be there, you need to be wake up earlier than anybody, come early and uh, leave office the final one. So people will see you will lead by example, not by just saying do this. You will show what you're doing and people just follow. As we know, gratefulness is the opposite feeling from fear. What or who are you grateful for today? I'm grateful to my mother and father. I'm grateful to my wife. I'm grateful to my kids. I'm grateful. You know, I, I believe that for all the things, all the passions in your life, I'm grateful to the people that I know that where I get my breakfast and I'm morning. I mean, it's just across the board. I'm rejoicing because every day you get up and you can live in this beautiful world and to do things, you ought to be grateful and rejoice in it. You know, show thankfulness, show it. So it doesn't matter if it's a person that's on the street. We have a homeless person that's here, and I like to go over and I'll buy his breakfast and try to be uh, kind. And the thing is, just saying thankful, fee, have somebody there that you know you can help is a big feeling. It's bigger than, you know, buying an uh, expensive car. It's just something that's inside of you. So from my standpoint, I'm grateful for all the things that I have. If I had little or I have a lot, I'm grateful either way. Awesome. Yep. When I hire people, I, I like to ask the candidates this question to better understand of their future goals and how those goals align with the position they're applying. I would like to ask you this question, even though I'm not hiring you, but this is just a conversation. But what would you want to do in the next 
next five to ten years? What is your five, ten year vision, objective, and mission? Well, I mean, as I said, I spoke at the United Nations. I've spoken at the UN twice, once in July and once a week and a half ago. And my vision is to create jobs, to democratize the opportunity. I've written an article in, in Forbes about Nikola Tesla's dream comes true, the democratization of opportunity. I really believe we need to band together on this planet to be able to solve some of the problems that are in front of us. Because if not, Victor, in 250 or 300 years, we may not be around, right? Mm. With the damage that we're creating to the planet. Well, we got to band together to help each other. We got to band together so people don't suffer. And I'm not saying mm -hmm. that this is about, you know, just doling money out. It's about creating opportunities for people where they can work and take care of their families. And we can start to solve things together and not look about the differences in one another, but really look about where the similarities are and where, you know, rejoice. One of the things that happens a lot of time in relationships, especially between men and women, is that you look at the negative side of the relationship. Oh, she doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. She's fat. She's this. But look at the positive. What things did you fall in love with that person? Why do you care about them? And let's talk about the positive because she's kind, because she's helped me, because she's this. Look at the positive. And that's what life's all about. It's not the Dostoevsky mentality. It's about really how do we look at the positives, right? I remember. He does, wow, you got it right. Yeah, about I got the Dostoevsky and Gogol. Gogol with the nose walking down the street. I'm like, what is this about? I was like, I couldn't figure it out. And yeah, the nose just... turned around the corner and it was looking. But it's, but that said, it. it's like, look at the, for the positive things in life. Look for the ways that you have similarities with that person. You know, my my grandpa, my grandmother is uh, Egyptian. She came from Egypt. She's Greek Egyptian. And mm -hmm. she moved over to the U.S. with a dream at 13 years old. My grandfather came from Greece. He came over from a small island, Greece, with a dream. And they didn't have a thing. They had a five cents. My grandfather had five cents in his pocket. And he also built 16 businesses. But wow. he came over with a dream. He worked hard and did it. And so have that dream, fulfill the dream, visualize where you want to go and go there. Very inspirational. Thank you. I heard many times people say, man, if I knew it 10 years ago, I would be a billionaire. What advice would you give to your younger self? I would probably, from my standpoint, you know, I like to do, when I was in high school, I didn't give a crap about school. I hated it. I would do martial <laughs> arts and sports. I just didn't want to do it. It wasn't that I wasn't smart. I just didn't like it. I didn't mm -hmm. want to do it. My father was a teacher in the same school. So I probably would have buckled down earlier and tried harder. And I probably would have gone to Stanford University and um, gotten an MBA at Stanford and gone through that route. Although, to be honest with you, I'm not unhappy with what I've done today. I'm mm -hmm. not unhappy with where I am. It's like, again, if you look at the positive side of where you are, I've done an IPO on NASDAQ. I've been involved in 17 companies. I have the most incredible accelerator, I believe, and, and venture studio in the world. I love what I'm doing. My partner is uh, dynamic. He's a 40-year-old, very aggressive uh, guy. We complement each other. You know, it's uh, great. So I would say that I probably would have done that or maybe not, Victor. I mean, I like what's happened. It's like life is not bad, right? It feels good. Right. And so um, having that fluidness to do the kind of things you want is me. It's exploring where you want to explore the things that you want to do and try them. Thank you, Gary, for sharing and being such an interesting and amazing guest at the Contributors Podcast. I hope our viewers enjoyed this interview and learned a lot from your experience. If you have an announcement, this is your time. The stage is yours if you'd like to make any announcement. Yeah, so I just want to say to each and every one of you out there, go out there and fulfill your dreams. Believe. Look at the positive parts of life and not the negative. We all can make a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs said. Each one of you has an opportunity to be able to do that. Passion, optimism, visualization are important. Visualize where you want to go. Treat people the right way. Bring kindness into the equation because all of us need each other and we can all make a dent in the universe. Let's go out hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder and make that difference. You need to stay safe. You need to stay happy and you need to stay healthy. And those are the key ingredients for our lives. Let's do it. AI is here to stay. Let's create jobs that make a dent and let's all do it together. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for being on this podcast. Thank you so much. My dear viewers, if you like this interview and found it helpful, please like and share to spread the wisdom if you want to be notified about my upcoming guests subscribe below and turn on the alarm if you want me to interview some people who make a change please leave their full names and the reasons why i should invite them to this podcast in in the comments below thank you for watching the contributors podcast stay tuned